Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Teslino Lake along the Matanuska River in the Matanuska Valley, just about 100 miles northeast of Anchorage, along the Alaska State Highway 1. The terrain is breathtakingly beautiful as glaciers grace the valleys of the northern slopes of the Chugach National Forest. The local topography includes some medium-sized mountains with forests, bushes, and other plant life covering them clear to the peaks. The pines, firs, and birch trees stand over the tall blueberry, alder, and willow bushes that dominate the forest floor. There are lakes and ponds, streams and creeks, as well as muskeg dotting the landscape, creating a diverse area for Mother Nature to fill biological niches amongst. Common fauna include moose, brown and black bear, sheep and goats, and numerous fur bearers like beavers. Hunting is a huge industry in the state known as the last frontier, and you don't have to go very far out of civilization to find success. This part of the world has winter seasons with very little light followed by summers with very little dark, allowing plant life to grow seemingly before your very eyes. Many records for overly large vegetables have been set in the fertile Matanuska Valley and add this potential for abundant food from plant sources and seasonal salmon runs and you get the perfect recipe for very large bears. In the fall of 1972, a taxidermist from New York by the name of Nelson Stymaker hired a guide by the name of Ray Caposella to lead him on a moose and goat hunt. The hunt was successful, and one day, when they flew over the moose kill, the hunters noticed a large brown bear claiming the gut pile. A brown bear will claim a carcass by defecating and urinating on or near the carcass, as well as covering it with soil, sticks, and other debris, and laying on or near it to guard it. The bear was a very large male bear, and the taxidermist knew it would make an incredible mount. The men assembled a plan and set it in motion. They hiked to within about 75 yards of where they knew the gut pile and the bear would be, and set up a spot to observe the bear. The bush was so thick from the summer's growth that only the bear's back and head could be seen easily as it dozed, waiting for its food coma to end. Every once in a while, the men would see the bear swap ends or roll over, but it never did reveal its shoulders well enough to get a good shot. Generally, a shot through the bones of the shoulder on a large brown bear, or probably even a small one, is ideal because it prevents them from getting away and also prevents them from getting you. The men watched for hours, waiting for the bear to stand up or change positions, but it was apparently very sleepy. Toward the second half of the day, the clouds began rolling in and threatened to worsen. The guide decided this was the point where he would try to make something happen. Ray told Nelson that he would go upwind of the bear to try to get the bruin to smell his scent and maybe that would draw him to his feet, offering a good shot. A headshot was out of the question as it would ruin any chance at the record books if the bear would qualify. So Ray sneaked his way upwind and began making noise. Ray began barking and screaming and doing the best he could to rouse the drowsy bear, but the animal didn't budge. Ray returned to his client and commented that the bear was either deaf or had sneaked out. Ray again decided to use the wind to bring his scent to the bear to get it to stand after warning the taxidermist not to shoot him instead. Stealthily sneak to about 100 yards of the bear to Nelson's right. Ray starts to holler and bark and yell again, but still no response. The guide then decides to creep closer to the stand of alders concealing the bear. Suddenly Ray starts yelling, Take him! Take him! in an urgent plea for Nelson to shoot the bear. Nelson scans the surroundings and cannot find the bear through his scope. He then begins looking over his scope in an attempt to see the bear, and all he can see is Ray backpedaling quickly, beginning to raise his own rifle. Ray fired his rifle, and that is when the bear became visible to Nelson from the knoll above. At first, Ray and Nelson thought that Ray was about 100 yards from the bear, but the bear was now only about 30 yards from Ray. While they watched the bear slumber, somehow it had changed locations, and neither man had seen it. When Ray sneaked in the second time, he had walked much closer to the bear than he intended. Nelson fired a quick shot at the bear just after Ray's first shot, and neither had a significant effect on the bear. Both men quickly worked the bolt actions on their rifles, but the bear closed in on Ray too quickly, swiping at him and missing. Ray's situation turned desperate as he turned his rifle into a club and brought it down brutally over the bear's head. Through the rifle shots fired by both men and the splintering of Ray's gun stock over the bear's head, it continued to charge the guide unfazed. 
Ray had dodged the bear as long as he could before the bear knocked him onto his back by shoving him in the chest with both paws. It quickly clamped its jaws onto his right thigh and dragged him back into the alders toward the moose gut pile it was still guarding. Nelson began running into the alders to defend Ray but quickly realized he would lose the ability to see a safe distance and reloaded. The leaves and branches completely obscured the attack but Ray's screams and the growling of the bear as it brutalized him were very clear. Moving for a better view, Nelson could see that the bear now had its teeth buried in Ray's skull and had lifted him up off the ground. It was shaking Ray violently as he screamed for help. His arms and legs flopped limply as his body was thrown back and forth by the enraged bear. As Nelson retrieved more shells, he had noticed the bear had returned to the top of the gut pile it was protecting. It presented a perfect shot, so he lowered his rifle and delivered a bullet to the bear's shoulders, dumping the bear completely off the gut pile. Nelson was certain he had connected in a vital spot and heard the bear growling and rolling around from the alders. The undergrowth in the alder patch completely obscured everything as Nelson held his rifle like a machine gun, ready for the bear to explode toward him at any moment. He wasn't sure where Ray was anymore and began shouting for him and heard quiet moans and breathing in return. Nelson has no idea where the bear was at this point either. Nelson entered the alder patch, a nervous wreck, but had to find Ray. He found Ray and saw him rolling on the ground with the bear laying behind him about 20 feet. The bear wasn't moving, and Ray was yelling instructions to kill the bear. Nelson fired a bullet into the bear's skull from about 10 feet away, and the bear jumped from the impact and twitched a bit, then lay still. Ray was still terrified from the attack, and Nelson leaned over him and held him in an attempt to calm him down. Ray asked him what all damage the bear had done to him, and he was drenched in blood. Nelson could see scratches all over Ray's face, chest, and back, but nothing gushing blood. Nelson could see obvious teeth marks in Ray's temple from where the bear bit onto his head, and its teeth must have raked across his face as his nose and cheeks were torn up. Ray's face was so crushed that he could not open his eyes, and his jaw would not work. He had to use his tongue to enunciate words. Ray's clothes were completely torn from nearly all of his body, and purple bear claw marks covered his entire chest and back. The bear's claws didn't break the skin, but obviously had damaged his body. It was also clearly bitten on his thigh, where the bear dragged him into the alders initially. The men devised a plan to have Nelson use the radio on the plane to get help, and Nelson nearly sprinted the three miles back to the plane after making sure Ray was warm and comfortable. Nelson frantically explained the details and location of the attack and requested a helicopter. Then he waited at the plane for the helicopter, which arrived with an Alaska state trooper and a doctor. The group were soon hovering over Ray, and it didn't look good. He wasn't moving or responding to their presence. The rescue party landed, but it was too late, as Ray was turning blue and rigor mortis was setting in. The state trooper took some photos of the scene, and they loaded Ray into the copter. Once back in Glen Allen, an autopsy was performed on Ray, and they found that his skull was fractured and several of his ribs were broken. Splinters from his ribs had pierced his heart and lungs. There was a fairly lengthy list of potentially fatal injuries to Ray, but a gunshot was not one of them. His friend did not shoot him. An Alaska state biologist returned to the site and examined the bear. He observed that the bear had been shot in each of the right and left shoulders and once in the head. The bear was a large male, estimated to weigh 750 pounds, whose hide squared at nearly 8 feet. <laughs> Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the remote and rugged mountains just north of Yellowstone National Park in southwestern Montana. The granite peaks soar over valleys stuffed with plants and animals. Each season brings its own state of energy as fall season transitions to a slower time. Pine, fir trees, and aspen trees mark out the horizon, and willow, blueberry, and buckbrush hug the lay of the land. In this area, elk, Moose, deer, sheep, and goats adorn the hillside, and black and brown bear, cougars, wolves, coyotes, and bobcats stalk the shadows. In September of 1995, the Schaefer family were on their last day of muzzleloader hunting for elk on Horseshoe Mountain in Montana. None of the hunters have successfully harvested anything yet, but the group is optimistic today is their day. Horseshoe Mountain is a 10,000-foot peak that lies just north of Yellowstone National Park and is surrounded by remote and rugged wilderness. As the hunters climb to the peak of the mountain, they can see the distant clouds of a storm blowing in. They spread out a bit to push through the timber and agree to meet back at camp at the bottom of the mountain for dinner. 
Bram is at the far end of the line of hunters and is an energetic high school football star who just graduated from high school the prior spring. He heads over a nearby ridge and separates himself from the group, trying to get into a different area than they had previously covered. Bram is cocky and strong in his youth and quickly gets into some promising elk habitat. He starts to see some older elk sign, but nothing exciting. As he looks around for more recent tracks, he notices that the birds are not singing and the usual forest sounds are all quiet. He begins to feel a sense of impending disaster and he suddenly sees a huge grizzly bear speeding toward him, growling, drooling, and popping her jaws as she surges toward him. Bram had inadvertently walked right between a sow grizzly bear and her cub as they were guarding a nearby elk carcass they were feeding on. As the sow blurs toward him, Bram yells for her to stop and tries to get out of her way, thinking maybe she'll run past him and leave him be. The sow sprints straight up to him and shoves him to his back with her paws like an NFL lineman. The sow shreds Bram's down jacket and blaze orange hunting vest as she digs her two and a half inch canines deeply into his shoulder. Then she paws him across the head and rips his scalp away from his skull. Bram decides he has to fight back and punches the bear in the nose, and she chomps a hole through his thumb joint. It is a one-sided fight at best, but Bram has no choice and fights for his life. Bram searches for his muzzleloader frantically and sees the enraged bear is now sitting on it. She puts her massive head on his lap and huffs her anger at him several times, as if telling him to stay away from her cub. She opens her enormous mouth, filled with long yellow teeth, and bites into Bram's right thigh and lifts him off the ground. She thrashes her head around, tossing him back and forth several times. When she does this, she tears open a huge chunk of his muscle and tissue from the bone and rips it down toward his knee a few inches. She then slams him to the ground, and he plays dead. The sow then walks a short distance away and continues to watch Bram to see if he is still a danger to her and her cub. Bram tries to lay still and slowly grabs his muzzleloader and points it in the sow's direction. She sees the movement and starts to return to finish him off, but Bram somehow squeezes off a shot. The bullet placement is lucky and drops her dead instantly. Bram is still trying to make sense of this terrifying and rapacious attack. As he begins inventorying his injuries, his shoulder hurts very badly, and he feels his head and replaces a portion of his displaced scalp. He is covered in blood and feathers. Pieces of his hunting vest litter the area around him. He slowly works his way to his feet, but collapses. His right thigh is shredded. It looks like large pieces of meat hanging from his wound, and he can see his femoral artery pulsating, now exposed to the air. He painstakingly pushes the meat and skin back into place and growls with pain as he tightens a makeshift tourniquet from his hunting vest. He knows he needs help immediately, so he raises his pistol and fires three shots in succession. This is the understood signal between hunters that someone needs help, but Bram hears nothing in return as rain quickly begins to fall. The storm from the horizon is now rolling in in full force. It brings with it 30 mile per hour winds and a constant cascade of chilling rain. Bram knows there is no one near him and that he has to save himself. He slowly wobbles to his feet again and uses his muzzleloader as a crutch. Slowly he steps and winces in pain each time. Pain is shooting through his body, but thankfully numbed a bit from adrenaline. His camp is over the hill on the other side of the mountain, so Bram decides to try to go around the mountain, as he cannot climb it. Bram realizes the desperation of his situation and begins to get angry. The madder he gets, the easier it is for him to move. So he cusses and yells for help, and he slips and limps his way around the mountain in the pouring rain. As the hours pass, the temperature drops to around 10 degrees, and Bram shivers as he struggles for his life. Back at camp, Bram's hunting party slowly filters in from the hunt, and everybody is accounted for except Bram. The group considers perhaps he shot an elk, but nobody heard a shot. They discuss how he is in amazing physical shape and should have beaten everyone back. He doesn't get lost easily, so this is uncharacteristic of him. Dennis, Bram's father, musters the hunters together and the group head up the mountain together in search of Bram. They yell and fire their pistols trying to get him to answer back, but the wind and rain kicked up in the storm muffle their attempts. Dennis has some peace of mind knowing he trained his son's survival skills, but is growing more concerned by the minute. The hunting party is concerned that Bram has fallen and injured himself and can't move. As they shiver and holler their way through the rain and thunder and lightning, the futility of their efforts finally set in. 
The hunters convinced Dennis to return to camp and resume the search in the morning light. He initially refuses, but finally relents and emotionally breaks down back at camp, in fear of the fate his son is facing. Earlier in the day, and a few hundred yards around the mountain from where Bram was attacked, father and son, Bruce and Bryce Pisecki, came upon some very recent bear scat and tracks. This immediately unnerves Bruce, as they are only hunting with muzzle loaders, which have a single shot. In order to shoot again, you have to pour in the powder and shove a bullet down and pack the load tight and replace the firing cap. This process can take the best shooters around a minute under the best of circumstances. Surprising a grizzly bear is not the best of circumstances. Bruce and Bryce decide to drop straight down the hill to the Rock Creek Trailhead and leave the area in an attempt to avoid the bear. As they're heading down the mountain, the men talk loudly and make as much noise as they can to alert any bears that they may come across. The weather turns bad an hour or so later, and the light of day fades, with the men still searching for the trailhead. As they stumble and slip their way through the stormy darkness, they eventually find the Rock Creek trailhead and sit down to take a break. Bruce voices his concerns that the muzzle loaders they are carrying may not even work in all this rain, so he aims his at a tree and fires it. It worked. The report of the shot is muffled by the wind, but is still loud. Unbeknownst to Bruce, Bram is just a short distance away, shivering and suffering in the rain and dark, as he still works his way around the hill. He's only traveled a few hundred yards, but is now energized with hearing the report of the shot. Bram lifts his pistol and fires an answer to Bruce's shot. Hearing the answering shot, Bruce thinks he's found his friend Dave, a member of their hunting party, and starts to yell at him, inviting him over. Bruce listens for a response, and the wind carries the reply perfectly to him. I've been attacked by a bear, and I need help. The voice he hears is desperate, and is clearly not Dave. The Piseki start to climb toward the voice, cautiously, as they are afraid the bear may be near. Bruce takes out his pistol and flashlight, and locates Bram standing in the rain, with steam rolling from his body. Bruce is shaken by the terrible sight of Bram. He asks the young man where the bear is, and he replies that he killed it. Bruce reassures Bram that he is going to help him. Bruce is a painter by trade and spends his days climbing and balancing on ladders, so he's in pretty good shape. He stoops over and hefts Bram onto his shoulder and begins walking down the trail back toward the Rock Creek trailhead. Bruce quickly tires and has to set Bram down and catch his breath every few yards or so, but he refuses to quit. As Bruce struggles to pack Bram down the trail, he feels the young man getting worse. Bruce stops and wraps his raincoat around Bram to try to preserve his heat and keep him alive. As the trio proceeds sporadically down the trail, the distance between required rests gets shorter and shorter. Bruce is becoming exhausted. He is now sweating in the cold rain and knows this could lead to him getting hypothermia. Bruce is inspired to call out to God for help and pulls his pistol out and fires off three last rounds into the air out of desperation. Bruce picks Bram up one more time and begins the cycle of walking and resting again. After a short distance, Bruce is exhausted and cries out to God for strength one more time. He bends over and picks Bram up over his shoulder, but this time Bruce feels strong and pain-free. He's actually able to carry Bram easier now and thanks God for the blessing. After a short while, Bruce feels Bram's condition worsening again. He sets the young man down on his own feet and wakes him up several times during the hike and watches him fade in and out of coherence. It's then that Bryce yells as he sees approaching flashlights. When Bruce fired the last three shots of his pistol, fellow elk hunter Andy Wolf was relaxing in his tent nearby, waiting out the storm. At first, Andy thinks some fool is shooting at an elk in this weather, but realizes the three-shot signal. He quickly assembles a small rescue team and heads out in the direction of the shots. About 45 minutes into their hike, the rescue party runs right into the Pisekis and Bram. Andy Wolf is an avid hunter and outdoorsman, but the most significant aspect about Andy is that he's a medical doctor trained in shock trauma. Dr. Wolf and his party assist in getting Bram back to a tent to receive medical help. As he begins examining Bram, Dr. Wolf looks at the deep bite into his shoulder and then looks over the scalp wound. Nothing too bad there, so he starts looking at Bram's thigh wound and is immediately very concerned. He sees the initial onset of gas gangrene and watches Bram's femoral artery pulse just a few inches away. This is concerning because gas gangrene can grow up to six inches per hour and if it reaches his femoral artery, it may rupture it. Bram could bleed to death in a few seconds if Dr. Wolf could not stop the bleeding. 
Two members of the hunting party are immediately sent out for help as Bruce and Dr. Wolf tends to Bram's wounds all night long, keeping him awake and out of falling into shock or coma. Dr. Wolf changes dressings on Bram's injuries and admires how tough the young cowboy is. Bruce quietly goes outside and has a short emotional breakdown from the intensity of the recent hours. As the sun slowly brightens the horizon, a helicopter breaks the peace of the morning with the chopping sounds of its rotors. The two men were successful in finding help. They load Bram into the copter and they head toward the hospital. Bruce sends a friend of his to search for Dennis to convey the good news. Dennis is yelling and searching for his son when he hears someone fire the shot pattern for success. Three quick shots followed by a single shot. He breaks down in tears of joy as the men head back to camp and depart to be with Bram. Bram was in the hospital for 18 days fighting for his life and was able to keep it and his leg. The physicians told him the bad news that he would never be able to ride a horse again, but the young cowboy proved them wrong and was back in the saddle within two months. Bram is fully recovered from the grizzly bear attack that nearly cost him his life and now has a little son, who he plans to take hunting up on Horseshoe Mountain with a muzzleloader for elk. Some people are just too darn stubborn to die. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the Shoshone National Forest in northwest Wyoming. The area consists of rocky crags composed of granite. Peaks soar to over 12,000 feet in elevation, and the pine and fir forests retreat in this alpine environment. The valleys showcase green meadows speckled with ponds and streams and lakes. Wildlife abounds, with moose, elk, and deer sampling the greenery, and wolves, bears, and cougars stalking the shadows. This place is a sportsman's paradise, but hidden dangers are aplenty on these slopes. 62-year-old Ron Leeming and his 37-year-old son, Ron Jr., have spent a few weeks each of the last several years archery hunting for elk near Boulder Basin. The 15-mile pack ensures that they are nearly always alone and have the land and the animals to themselves. It is a time of bonding, shared over three generations, but this trip poses a threat that could bring that tradition to a tragic end. Each year they manage to camp in the same location and stay up beneath the night sky dappled with stars. Commemorating previous adventures and curiosities, the men grow their bond stronger and pursue their favorite game animal, bull elk. To hunt elk, one of the men will set up in an ambush position with his bow and arrow, while the other operates an elk call to bring in challengers to a perceived rival. The challenge of convincing one of the most wary animals in the continent to come into archery range is a pursuit that develops a bond that transcends time. Being located in such a remote area is not without its risks. The previous year, Ron ruptured a tendon in his arm while putting his saddle on his horse. This injury left his arm in severe pain and prevented him from drawing his bow, effectively ending his hunting for the year. After returning home, a surgery was successfully performed to repair the tendon, but the rehab and healing process took a very long time. By the time he was okay to resume archery practice, he had lagged in his abilities to the point where he was worried that he could even fully recover. When the season finally rolled around, he had built up just enough confidence to participate. Ron and Ronnie had two very different success levels in their hunting experience. Ronnie had taken several elk in prior years, while his father had a distinct history of missing shots at critical junctures. This year alone, he had missed twice and was hoping to make up for it in his next opportunity. On the morning of September 12, 2008, as the duo prepared to head up the trail to hunt, Ron said a quiet prayer for success. He was feeling like he may be too old to play a young man's game, and wondered if his best days hunting were behind him. He asked God to guide his arrow, and recognized the futility of such a selfish prayer. Given what was about to unfold, his request was timely, and answered perfectly. The two men made their way through the morning twilight to one of their favorite hunting spots, they referred to as the Rock. A long series of cliffs with clustered timber stands gave them both a limited escape route for the game they pursue, and the opportunity to see it. In order to hunt this broken territory, where swirling winds carry your odors to nearby noses, they were wearing elk urine to disguise their scent. Their camouflage clothing helped conceal them from wary eyes while they slowly picked their way through the low sagebrush. They discussed the tactics they were planning on using at this place, and Ronnie took his position about forty yards or so higher up on the hill than his father. He then began calling for elk. He called for about a half an hour when the men noticed that a bull had broken from cover below them and was now moving toward the ambush point near Ron. 
It approached to just over 80 yards and just out of range for Ron to shoot it with his bow. It began to work over a small sapling with its antlers as a demonstration of its toughness. Ronnie continued to call and try to entice the bull closer with more challenges using his elk bugle. As he called, he heard a rustle in the bushes just behind and downwind of him. It was a smaller bull called a raghorn. The bull smelled Ronnie's scent on the breeze and immediately bolted. The big bull was still raking his antlers on the small tree, though, so Ronnie continued trying to work him into position for his father to shoot him. The big bull slowly began to make his way closer to Ron and was only about 35 yards away. The wind was perfect and led their scent in the opposite direction from the bull. Just as Ron was getting ready to draw his bow, the bull bolted before the elder could get a shot sent. Ronnie was perplexed as to what could have sent the bull into such a panicked exit. It couldn't have smelled the men, and they didn't make any sudden movements that would give them away. It was at that moment that Ronnie stood up and turned around. Where the small bull was previously, now a large male grizzly bear emerged from the brush. The 11-year-old 500-pound bear rippled with muscle as it strode from cover and briefly sized Ronnie up. Its dark coat hid it well in the shadows and earth tones of the surrounding terrain. After only a few seconds, the bear was covering the ground between it and Ronnie with alarming speed. He could see the eyes of the beast focused on him as it pumped its claws toward the ground, reaching further each time as it picked up speed. The bear had heard the elk calls from the lemmings, as well as the other two bulls. It came in fully expecting to see one of its favorite prey animals, and those predatory instincts are very hard to extinguish. Now the lemmings had decided, when they were picking their gear up for the trip, that weight would be important. In order to cut down on their pack load, they had decided to leave some heavier and probably unnecessary items at home. Two of these items turned out to be extremely important on this trip, bear spray and a firearm. Now facing the charging bear, Ronnie only had his bow to protect him, and considered drawing down on the bear as it approached. The bear was upon him so quickly that all he had time to do was jump out of its way. The bear streaked past Ronnie, but quickly turned to continue its pursuit. Ronnie next used a tree for brief cover as he bolted downhill and away from the bear. Yelling at the bear as he ran, it wasn't long before the bear and Ronnie were approaching Ron. Right behind Ronnie, his father could see the massive bear focused in pursuit of his son. The thought of his son being mauled flashed through his mind, as did fond memories of his son's infancy and childhood. His protective ire was roused, and he knew he had to stop this right away. Now, the struggles they'd faced the past year with his injury and missing shots at elk were nowhere near his mind. As Ronnie ran toward his father, Ron drew his bow back and pointed his arrow at the charging bear, with his feet planted firmly on the ground. From Ronnie's perspective, he could see his father as he approached him. He saw Ron draw back his bow, and even saw the arrow zip past his legs only a few feet away. He was so intent on escape, he didn't bother to turn to see if the arrow had hit its mark or skipped harmlessly across the ground. The bear caught Ronnie and pushed him to the ground. Rolling over onto his back, Ronnie punched and pushed the bear in a feeble attempt to defend himself. He knew he had to keep the bear's jaws from getting anywhere near his face, neck, and head. The bear clamped its jaws onto his elbow, which was crushed under the force of a single bite. As the bear swatted him back and forth, Ronnie was tossed all over the place in a confusing scene of flashing teeth and slashing claws. Somehow, the bear had swatted him in such a way that Ronnie found himself up on his feet. The pain he should have felt was dulled by all the adrenaline his body was dumping into his bloodstream. And as people in dangerous situations tend to do, his mind quickly found a possible solution. He sprinted toward a tree with a fork in its trunk. Hoping he could wedge himself into the crotch of the tree and find protection, Ronnie bolted toward it. He didn't quite make it into the crotch of the tree, but was caught by the bear right at the base of it. The bear bit and tore at his hand and his back as had him pressed into the ground. Ron reached for another arrow as he watched the shape of the massive bear completely obscure his son. He knew he couldn't shoot at it, as it would be too risky and put Ronnie's life in even more danger. From deep inside him, Ron could feel a primordial anger well up. He ran over to the bear and began to beat on it with his bow. He struck the bear's head and back repeatedly until it turned Ronnie loose. Just then the attack stopped, and the bear turned away a bit. It slowly and clumsily began to stagger down the hill. Ronnie yelled for his father to shoot it again, but Ron was afraid of further angering the bear and had no idea the true magnitude of the wounds he'd inflicted on the bear. The body language of the bear told the experienced hunters that it was in big trouble and didn't want any more to do with them. It staggered just a few more steps and tipped over dead where it lay. 
Unbeknownst to either of the men, Ron's shot placement, whether luck, divine intervention, or marksmanship, had severed a major artery near the bear's heart and gashed its heart muscle. Ronnie was covered in blood, and his surroundings started to blur and spin as he began entering shock. The bear spent more than a few dreadful seconds on Ronnie near the base of the tree, but hadn't managed to bite onto more than his elbow and hand. Nothing major seemed damaged badly, aside from some nasty bear claw marks on his back and face. That is when the men figured out that all the blood Ronnie was covered in had come from the wound his father's arrow had inflicted on the bear. As it frantically tried to kill Ronnie, it had coincidentally sprayed its blood all over him. He was still a nervous wreck, but he wasn't mortally wounded. Ron quickly began to build a fire in an attempt to ward off Ronnie's shock. The trail ride out was 15 miles of the most difficult and treacherous riding a man could do, even when he was healthy and unhurt. Ronnie was fading in and out of coherence and presence. Their cell phones were unable to pick up a reliable signal, and they knew no one would be expecting them for several more days. They really had no choice. They had to pack up their horses and ride to get Ronnie medical help. After they were ready to leave, the irony of the roles being switched as Ron helped Ronnie into his saddle came to their minds. It took the leaming six hours of hard scrabble horse riding until they ran into Carl Sarwine, who was headed up Boulder Creek to his own elk hunting camp. Carl saw the pair from a distance, and they were familiar from prior years' hunts, so he yelled out a greeting toward them. He could see Ronnie was bundled up in layers, despite the warmth of the day. As Carl approached the pair, Ronnie calmly stated that he'd just been mauled by a bear and they were going back to get medical help. Carl could see the blood and scratches on Ronnie's face, but also noted he didn't appear to be in too bad a shape. The father and son simply tipped their hats to Carl as they rode by and continued their descent. After such an intense event, the six-hour horse ride had Ronnie thinking about priorities and what hunting meant to him. He was assessing how risky it is, but also considered what it meant to him and his father over the years. He knew in his heart that they would be back to hunt here again. As they headed down the trail, a bull elk bugled just a few hundred yards from the trail they were on. Ronnie urged his father to go shot it, but his father said he probably couldn't hit it. Ronnie quipped that if he made that elk chase him, he bet Ron could hit it. Ronnie was treated for puncture wounds and released from the hospital the same day. He made a full recovery and still enjoys the outdoors. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider liking the video and subscribing to our channel. Clicking the bell icon will let you know when we post new videos and sharing our videos to your social media platforms helps spread awareness. As a valued member of our human community, adventure bravely and be safe out there, especially in bear country.